let me introduce uh, Professor Russell Napier. Russell's worked in the investment business for over 30 years. He's been advising global institutional investors on asset allocation since 1995. He's the author of a book called The Solid Ground Investment Report for institutional investors, and he's currently writing other books. He's the co-founder of an investment research portal called ERIC, and no doubt someone here apart from uh, Russell will know what ERIC stands for, but obviously a good research portal. He's the founder and course director of the Practical History of Financial Markets at the Edinburgh Business School. Russell's the chairman of an international investment trust and is a member of the investment advisory committees of two fund management companies. All in all, that means he knows a lot about investment. Russell has degrees in law from Queen's University, Belfast, and Magdalen College at Cambridge. Um, he's also an honorary professor at both Harriet Watt University and the University of Stirling, so all close to home. Now, for us today, the interesting part is in 2014, Russell founded the charitable venture called The Library of Mistakes, a business and financial history library in Edinburgh that, interesting enough, has branches in India and Switzerland. Russell's talk today is on the Library of Mistakes, which is why we've invited him. Uh, Russell, we're absolutely delighted that you've taken on our challenge to talk to us for the next 20 minutes or so. I'm sure it'll be a very interesting talk, not least because um, we all make mistakes. Over to you, Russell, and thank you for joining. Thank you very much. I mean, if I was going to talk about mistakes, you really should have given me about three and a half hours. <laughs> <clears throat> and that would have just been my own mistakes, never mind everybody else's. So uh, uh, I'm going to split this really into two bits. I'm going to tell you about the library and what it does. And then I'll talk about some interesting mistakes from history, which I think give us all some important lessons for the, uh, for the future. Uh, you've covered it. It's a business and financial history library. It sounds like the most boring uh, library in the world, which is probably why we called it the Library of Mistakes, just to make it sound slightly more uh, interesting. But fundamentally, actually, it's not a business and financial history library, and we are adding to our collection on many other fields. But what it's really about is what's known as human decision making under uncertainty. Uh, you may or may not be familiar with that term, but it's the term that was used in Daniel Kahneman's Nobel Prize citation. Uh, and Daniel Kahneman, who was a, who is a psychologist and uh, best-selling author, so I mentioned his name because you may have come across his famous book, Thinking Fast and Slow, actually won the Nobel Prize for economics, even though he'd never studied economics, which I think is an incredible achievement because he studied human decision-making under uncertainty. And that's what finance is. It's planning for an uncertain future. But actually, when you swing that golf club, you're also planning for an uncertain future. And when you cross that road, you're also planning for an uncertain future. And that's what human beings do. And we're really quite bad at it. And we really hate uncertainty. And we really do everything we can not to deal with uncertainty. And that includes often burying our head in the sands. And finance is no different and has a very bad name for doing exactly that. But of course, one of the problems for finance is it has lived entirely in the future and sometimes in the long future. And therefore, the uncertainty is particularly high in this field of one's planning and investment that maybe doesn't pay back for five, six, seven years. Uh, so you won't hear me defending the financial community very much because uh, there's not a lot to defend. Uh, but at least in one defense, I would say this, it's dealing with massive levels of uncertainty, political, social, economic, technological, uh, and therefore it is going to be a profession prone to more, more mistakes. So why do we have this library? Well, the problem I think today for anybody involved in finance is that finance as an ac academic subject does not include many of the uncertainties I've just discussed with you. As it's taught as an academic subject, it is really being boiled down to ones and zeros and into numbers. And finance has become heavily mathematized. And the future has become heavily mathematized. And the future of economics is the future of human behavior. And I think it's impossible, not impossible, but incredibly difficult to put all that down into an equation and then to put it all down with one decimal point. So we're really revolting against the decimal point. And we're saying you cannot use a decimal point to forecast the future, nor can you use numbers to forecast the future. Finance 
is finance is taught in university, which is the distillation down to the decimal point. But here are the things that are thrown away in distillation. I'm sure everybody here, most of you being Scottish, are very familiar with the concept of distillation. Uh, lots of stuff gets thrown away. And here's what we've thrown away in how we teach finance today. Politics, sociology, philosophy, psychology, uh, and often morality. And yet, if we look at the history of finance and economics, we'll see it's crammed full of all of those things. And yet, somehow, in this modern intellectual cul-de-sac, we threw them all away. So in reading financial history, we put them all back in again. So it may be just a shortcut to try and throw back into this equation all of that stuff that was distilled away in the pursuit of certainty and the pursuit of the decimal point. I think, as I said, that expands to much more than just finance and to many of the decisions we're making that all of these things have to be put in. And of course, in the modern era and in the post-COVID era, I think it's clearer than ever that politics, sociology, and psychology need to be taken into account in how we're going to plan for the future. Uh, but I can assure you, and I hope there are some professors from the finance faculties here, but I can assure you that that is not where we currently are in the teaching of finance. We continue to believe that it should have one decimal point at least in it. And the more numbers you can cram to the right-hand side of the decimal point, the more people take you seriously. Uh, and in my opinion, it should be exactly the reverse. Uh, the pursuit of certainty in an uncertain world is the cause of more mischief than just about anything I can think of. So that is our, our aim is to try and balance up, if you like, the understanding of economics and finance, but also uh, decision-making. So Kahneman's Nobel Prize, he, he approached it as a psychologist. We're coming at it from a different angle, which is the angle of simply reading about how it's worked in the past and history. Why else might you want to study mistakes? Uh, well, you probably know there's a famous um, uh, General Karl von Clausewitz, a German general who once said that no plan survives contact with the enemy. Uh, and what we have in the library of mistakes is all the plans that didn't survive contact with the enemy. Uh, the uh, Wellington famously said that all the, all, the, all the business of war and all the business of life is knowing what is on the other side of the hill. And uh, that's what we do every day. We try to work out what's on the other side of the hill and we're often wrong. So by studying why we've been wrong, we can be more right because fundamentally, these are the same mistakes. They're not mistakes based on human stupidity. They're not necessarily mistakes in having the wrong information. They're mistakes based upon how the human brain works and how it doesn't actually coincide with the actions of a computer at all. How it is bounded, it's not completely rational. We have systemic traits in our thinking that lead us in the wrong direction. And that is really what the work of behavioral finance is all about. So by studying that across disciplines, we hope to be able to work out, but not eliminate the common traits that lead us into these intellectual cul-de-sacs, which sometimes can have gross impacts. And if one thinks of a general, uh, you can see exactly how big these uh, misconceptions can be. Uh, so that's what we're, we're trying to do. There's a better way of putting this. It was put by, not by General von Clausewitz, but Mike Tyson who once famously said, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. <laughs> and what we have in the library of mistakes are all those punches in the mouth. And we hope that people who read about them and take those punches, uh, sort of metaphorically, not literally, are better prepared for when those punches come in the future. So that's what the library is about. I should, of course, mention that it's a real library. I'm not in the library, by the way. This is my own library. Uh, it is in Weems Place Mews. And for those of you who know Weems Place, which runs between Queen Street and uh, Harriet Row, it is through that arch on the left-hand side. And it is a public library. It's open to anybody. And uh, you just need to go to our website at libraryofmistakes.com and arrange a visit. It's an unmanned library, which is why you need to arrange a visit. Uh, you can register and uh, make a visit. We also, pre-COVID, were running regular lectures at the library. Uh, they became so popular, we had to expand to other venues. We were using the EICC. We had over uh, nearly 200 people attending one of these lectures. And they are, yes, they're about events that happened in the past, but they are also supposed to be events in the past that help us decide what we should do in the future. So that's the library itself and the reason uh, it exists. And obviously, you're all welcome to, to come along to the library. We're, in, we're now reopen, and you can do that through going to the, uh, the website. I thought I'd just tell a few tales from the past, which I hope are fruitful, useful, and interesting for the future. A couple of them involve Scots. 
who seem to have a particular proclivity for making the best out of the world of finance. Uh, and one in particular I thought I'd begin with is a man called John Law, who is from Edinburgh. Uh, he called him, styled himself John Law of Lauriston. And for those of you who've been to Lauriston Castle, that was briefly owned by the Law family and hence his, his style. And it, John Law's story is about how we make money. Uh, and I'm about to tell you how we make money and you may be shocked because 90% of people I talk to don't understand how we make money. Money is made up by commercial banks. It is not created by the government. It is not created by the Bank of England. It is entirely fabricated by the commercial banking system. That is how money is made. And in 1695 on the Royal Mile, a new organization opened to get into the business of creating money. That business was called the Bank of Scotland. Its only asset was a pile of gold. And they put the gold behind the, uh, behind the counter halfway up the Royal Mile and they started lending money. And what they did is if I walked in and wanted to borrow five pounds to buy a horse and cart, they would write me a piece of paper which said that that piece of paper entitled me, entitled me to a, that gold behind the counter. And of course, then I paid interest. But I took the piece of paper onto the high street in Edinburgh and people knew that RBS, or sorry, uh, Bank of Scotland had this gold and they could always take that piece of paper in for the gold. So the piece of paper was money because anybody would accept it knowing that it was backed by the gold. Of course, I think you know where this is going next. It wasn't long before the Bank of Scotland discovered that this paper wasn't coming back in. None of the gold was leaving from behind the counter. So with their 300 pounds of gold, why not issue 400 pounds of paper? That's what happened. In that instant, that private sector institution, a corporation completely uncontrolled by the government was suddenly in the business of creating money. And that is exactly how our banks create money today. Now the asset they hold behind the counter is not gold. It's called what's called a commercial bank reserve. It's a, it's a balance they have with the Bank of England. Uh, but that's the business we're still in. Now, John Law, and anybody can see that this is a, a hugely profitable business. Uh, Law decided he was, his father was a goldsmith and his father was really in the same business. He was in one of the Luckin booths, which adjoined St. Giles Cathedral. Uh, and being in receipt of a lot of gold as a goldsmith, both under his own account and holding it for his clients, he also started issuing paper even before the Bank of Scotland existed. Uh, and was making money. The, so, so, so Law learned about this and he learned how you can make money out of thin air. And he came up with various proposals about opening banks that really had very little, uh, certainly not gold backing them, but perhaps other things. And he was uh, sent away from Scotland with a flea in his ear for such proposals in about 1708, 1709. Uh, the English also didn't much like this proposal either. So he uh, he wasn't making much progress in England, but then he had a stroke of luck because he killed a man. Uh, Law was what we would call today a rake, and as a rake, he fought a duel over a woman in London, uh, was briefly imprisoned, escaped and flew, flew to Paris. Uh, when it flew, I mean, uh, ran away to Paris. There he pitched this to the French, and the French loved the idea. And Law got into the business of doing this in France, created a huge amount of paper money, uh, and basically bankrupted France. Uh, you could say his idea was hijacked by the regent at the time, who liked the idea of having money for nothing. Uh, but whoever we finally blame for this, it effectively bankrupted the whole of France and arguably has been a reason why France has found it incredibly difficult to win wars uh, since 1720 when this was going on, because the French people have been desperately suspicious of paper money ever since and desperately suspicious of paper ever since. Uh, and when the time came for the great wars between uh, France and the United Kingdom, the United Kingdom found it fairly easy to raise lots of finance by issuing government paper bonds, consuls, and the French found it very difficult. So the, the British were quite good at mobilizing savings to finance war and the French weren't. And that may be due to a Scotsman who destroyed the faith of the French people in paper uh, a long time ago. Uh, I said there were morals and lessons for this for the future. Well, it is that the supply of money uh, is in the private sector, not in the public sector. It can get out of control and it always leads to inflation. Uh, and we do live in a similar era today. Our banks are pumping out a huge amount of money into the system under government fiat, government mandate. Uh, coronavirus bounce back loans come to mind. We are seeing a rapid growth in the supply of sterling. And historically, we would expect inflation to follow. I don't think we have another John Law operating out of London, uh, creating all of this money. Uh, but it's at a high enough level that we should be concerned about the future of inflation. It's interesting that most of the things I'll talk about all happen immediately after warfare. 
During warfare, uh, it's a sad truth, there is a huge amount of profit-making opportunity around normally. And when the war ends, these profit opportunities tend to disappear. Not only that, the, uh, the yield on government bonds tends to fall. The government's not so desperate for money uh, and therefore they offer less interest. People are used to making quite a lot of money. So they look for schemes where they can make money. Uh, and this really takes us on to the, the second uh, illustration. And, and it begins with a quote from a man called Walter Badgett. And Badgett was a very famous uh, author of the late 19th century banking analyst. Uh, his book on banking is still used by central bankers to this very day. But he once made the famous quote that a John Bull can withstand anything except 2%. Uh, John Bull, as you'll know, is the uh, archetypal Englishman. Uh, he probably should have extended that to something a bit wider than that. And what he meant by that is people with savings expect a certain return. And I think it's interesting looking through history. They expect, in my opinion, they expect about 5%. That's what they think is reasonable. I mean, to get that money, you've had to save hard. You've had to pay taxes on, the, on your income. You've had to not spend the other bit. And you do believe that you're deserving of something in return for it. And basically, when we go below 5% on interest rates, on deposit rates, people start taking outlandish risks in pursuit of the 5%. And that's where we are today. People are taking outlandish risks because they want at least the 5%. Some people are more greedy. They want even more. But I don't have to tell people watching this that interest rates are incredibly low. Now, the next war we're going to talk about is the Napoleonic War. And the immediate aftermath of the Napoleonic War uh, included independence from most of Latin America. And one man who was heavily involved in that independence, sometimes fighting, but more often running away, was a... Scottish general called Gregor MacGregor, who fought with Bolivar, I say fought with Bolivar, but was often uh, behind the scenes, not too close to the front line with Bolivar, but returned to Scotland in 1822 and informed everybody that Bolivar had made him uh, a king of a Latin American country called Poye. And he was now in fact the cazique of Poye. He had a book written about Poye, which showed its wonderful opera house, its great wide boulevards, and all the pleasures and splendors of Poye. And he then, uh, just at the corner of where the bridges cuts over the Royal Mile, he then began to issue bonds to the great Scottish investing public, La sold them land deeds as well. He actually sold them currency. And in 1823, they all shipped out to Poye. Now Poye is today, or, or, or is where Panama is today. It is a malaria infested swamp and it's never seen an opera house and it never will see an opera house. And of the people who journeyed in pursuit of uh, the wealth of Poye, uh, two thirds of them died and in terms of the first ship. There were five more ships on the way when the uh, stragglers were on their way out and they were fortunately diverted just in time. McGregor obviously made quite a lot of money. You can't probably see it behind me, but I have one of these bonds he issued on Edinburgh's Royal Mile framed uh, behind me. He only made two interest payments on that bond. Uh, no other of the coupons have been removed from it. Uh, but what on earth possessed the people of Scotland to believe that there was this mythical, wonderful paradise? It's interesting because one of the main selling points for McGregor to convince the Scots of this great opportunity was the failure of the last one. Uh, I'm sure some of you will know that in around 1696, Scotland had done this before. Uh, in the what was called the Darien scheme. And not surprisingly, actually, it was roughly in the same area with Central America. And one of McGregor's great selling points was that the Scots could expunge the stain of Darien by successfully finding this colony uh, in the same venue. And that, of course, failed. But it was fundamentally because interest rates were so low. Uh, after the Napoleonic Wars, they, they collapsed. The government wasn't borrowing such, such money. They were down to 2%. And people, not just Scots, because McGregor also sold these bonds in London and he sold them in Paris. Uh, they wanted a higher return and in search of a higher return, they took this obscene uh, amount of risk, not just with their money, because as I said, many of them uh, went over there uh, and actually died. McGregor managed to avoid jail for all of this, uh, mainly because he also went to Paris where it was pretty difficult to get him, to get him back. Uh, he didn't make a huge amount of money out of it, but he made enough money to uh, keep him going for, for some time. So, so what is the moral of the story? Well, it's a slightly different one. The first one was about the ability to create money and inflation. And this one is really about interest rates. And when they are so low, somewhere out there, you're gonna find someone who can persuade you 
that you're not actually taking a huge amount of risk uh, to go in pursuit, uh, pursuit of higher returns. And it's easy to say, but these people are just fraudsters. All you're telling us is that sometimes there are fraudsters. Uh, that's not the moral of the story. The moral of the story is there are certain environments in which fraudsters can prosper. And the number one environment in which a fraudster can prosper uh, is when your interest rates are particularly low. Uh, I just wanted to sort of rush right up into the 20th century because I know time, time is short uh, and read you a quote from one of the best authors on, on finance we've ever had. He's a Canadian called uh, J.K. Galbraith. He was also economic advisor to President, uh, President Kennedy, but he writes with a great lucidity and he writes particularly well on the issue of fraud. So this is what he said about the issue of fraud and the conditions in which it exists. And I'm telling you this because I think it's absolutely rife today. It is absolutely everywhere. Uh, and it will only be revealed when the tide goes out. Uh, a quote from Warren Buffett, you only see who's swimming without trunks when the tide goes out. But when this tide goes out, there'll be a lot of it going on. Uh, so this is the, the more eloquent way that uh, J.K. Galbraith uh, puts that. In many ways, the effect of the crash, and he refers here to the crash of 1929 on embezzlement was more significant than on suicide. To the economist, embezzlement is the most interesting of crimes. Alone among the various forms of larceny, it has a time parameter. Weeks, months, or years may elapse between the commission of the crime and its discovery. This is a period, incidentally, when the embezzler has his gain, and the man who's been embezzled feels no loss. This is a net increase in psychic wealth. At any given time, there exists an inventory of undiscovered embezzlement in, or more precisely not in, the country's business and banks. This inventory, it should perhaps be called the bezel, amounts at any moment to millions of dollars. It also varies in size with the business cycle. In good times, people are relaxed, trusting, and money is plentiful. But even though money is plentiful, there are always many people who need more. Under these circumstances, the rate of embezzlement grows, the rate of discovery falls off, and the bezel increases rapidly. In depression, all this is reversed. Money is watched with a narrow, suspicious eye. The man who handles it is assumed to be dishonest until he proves himself otherwise. Audits are penetrating and meticulous. Commercial morality is enormously improved. The bezel shrinks. I'll have to leave it up to you to conclude which part of this cycle we are in for the size of the bezel. Uh, but in my opinion, despite the fact that we've just recently been through, a very large recession, we are still seeing lots of bezel in, in the system. You need conditions for this to happen and we have the perfect conditions today. And I'm uh, fearful what might happen uh, when the size of this particular bezel uh, is unleashed upon the people of, uh, well, the people of the world really, uh, in terms of uh, anywhere you are in the world today, these things are, are running rife. Uh, where will I finish? Well, I'm already run over my time. Obviously I've got lots and lots of these stories from financial history, but I think what we're talking about here, the final one is really a man called Charles Ponzi. Yes, the Ponzi scheme is named after a real man. He was an interesting uh, Italian born in Boston and uh, went to Montreal. In Montreal, he defrauded a bank by bouncing checks. He wrote a newsletter which went bankrupt. He bankrupted his wife's fruit selling business uh, and he also was convicted of people smuggling. So he was the perfect person to convince the people of Boston that he had a brilliant investment scheme. He convinced them after World War I that he could make them a fortune through international postage stamp arbitrage. Now, it may sound ridiculous, but that's the whole point about a Ponzi scheme. You have to have something that can convince people that there is some little way that you can offer exceptional returns. Now, at the time, interest rates would have been 2 or 3%. Ponzi was offering 50 because he claimed he could do this arbitrage between his native Italy and America. And I think we all know how much money flooded into the Ponzi scheme. He wasn't the first person to do it. He just did it with such style and panache uh, that it's named after him. In the Library of Mistakes, we have a copy of a newspaper. It's the Fitchburg Sentinel from 1921. And it was uh, published just three days before Ponzi was arrested. And the headline in the Fitchburg Sentinel is as follows. Ponzi refuses to reveal investment secret. And there was a good reason for not revealing that investment secret because there was no investment secret. Uh, Ponzi was on bail, left bail, went to Florida and then sold some fraudulent uh, land in Florida uh, and basically never stopped, released from prison, returned to Italy. And in Italy was the greatest hero there'd ever been. As far as the Italians were concerned, there is nothing greater than an Italian who can fleece money out of the Americans. And he lived quite a nice, relaxed retirement, getting lots of visitors to, uh, to talk about this. 
Uh, once again, incidentally, just after a war, interest rates were low, people were desperate. I think risk profile went up as well after warfare, after tragedy. People tend to take higher risks. Now, obviously, you can see where I'm going with this after the COVID crisis. Are we entering a period where the risk thermometer for the average citizen is rising the, after a period of tragedy? Or are we not? I'm not going to suggest we're going into the roaring 20s, but for those of you who have read F. Scott Fitzgerald, you will know that there was a decided change in the attitude and the morality of a nation following World War I, uh, and that definitely led to more risk-taking. It certainly led to a great economic expansion and a great economic crisis. So I, I'm intending to pause there, having just scratched the surface on some of the issues of financial history and what they can tell us. But I hope what you've garnered from that is that within all of this, it's really about human behavior. And perhaps literature can tell us as much as history uh, about that human behavior. And if economic and financial history sounds like the driest subject you could ever imagine, let's just call it human behavior and mass human behavior uh, which I think is more interesting because mass human behavior is ultimately much more delusional than the individual human behavior. So if you want more reading on that, I think one of the best things was written by another enterprising Scot in the 1840s, a man called Charles Mackay, or Mackay, who wrote uh, uh, what's it? Uh, Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. And it's still in print. It's incredible. Here we are, uh, 2021, written in 1841. Uh, madness and the popular delusions of crowds. It's as entertaining today as it was then. And frankly, you would have thought, given our progress in, in uh, technology, our progress in so many ways that we would now have passed such madness of crowds. But sadly, and potentially the internet, social media have meant that the madness of crowds can now diffuse and infect places that it couldn't even affect before. So on that cheerful note about our proclivity towards madness, getting worse rather than better, I will hand it back to you. Well, Russell, thank you. I knew you would give a fascinating talk and you really have done. I think you've frightened some of us on the call, you know, <laughs> because as you rightly indicated, the human behavior features throughout all the stories you were telling. And of course, um, we're all left with immediate thought, well, you know, how much, are we at risk today with the sort of madness that you were speaking about, uh, given that, you know, many of us have just had, you might call, you know, good solid careers. We all have good pensions or working towards pensions. And we tend to put money in relatively safe places. And yet you indicate um, perhaps there aren't such safe places after all. So thank you very much for, for that. Uh, fascinating. I could ask you lots of questions, but let me go to the floor first. If you would like to ask a question, just give me a little wave and come off mute. <coughs> and who would like to ask our first question today? Please. Yeah. Uh, Jeffrey, thank you for joining us. I didn't welcome you at the beginning, sir. And Peter Sutton's joined us as well, so that's great. Uh, a hand from David. So David, you come off mute and ask your question, please. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Russell. That was fascinating. Um, why are people so gullible? I mean, there's a the phrase that if something looks too good to be true, it will be. So what, what is it about the offer that's, with hindsight, ridiculous? People who have been calmed often are embarrassed, don't report it, say, I'm so ashamed. So what, what is it? That, what's the hook that catches someone to make uh, such an irrational decision? So, David, you can say I'm surrounded by lots of books where I've been seeking an answer to that question for now nearly 30 years. There is one line, I think, that sums it up better than anything else. And of course, that doesn't mean to say that it encapsulates all of this, but it's a line from a book by a man called Charles Kindleberger, uh, Mania's Panics and Crashes. And he said, there is nothing more disturbing to one's well-being than watching your friends get rich. Now, I, I mean, I don't know if it means as much to you as it means to me. But when you are a rational, conservative person and the guy next door, who you personally believe is an idiot, suddenly starts making a lot of money, you think to yourself, this can't be that difficult because I know he's an idiot and I'm smarter than he is. So I need to get into this. And you may resist it for three months or nine months or a year or a year and a half. But ultimately, that, I think, is what forms a crowd. The crowd forms and rational people do irrational things. What is that? I mean, we've got lots of people here who know more about this. Is that jealousy? What is it? There's certain human emotion in there, which means that I cannot abide to see other people getting well. Now, some of us are better at resisting that than others. 
I've been very good at resisting it, which is, uh, you know, it's a good thing and a bad thing, but uh, most human beings can't resist it. And when someone you believe is not very bright, makes a lot of money, you consider that you must be able to make even more. That's my best explanation of it. But I'm sure a psychologist could write a whole book on that. I think what's really crucial is that when a crowd forms, and there are several books in here on the psychology of crowds, we behave differently. Now, I don't know to what extent everybody here joins a crowd, whether it's a football crowd or anything else. You do things, inhibitions decline. And the decline in inhibition is a decline in risk, take, is a change in risk taking activity. Uh, I think we saw that in George Square in Glasgow about 10 days ago. You know, in a crowd, perfectly normal people will do perfectly abnormal things. So you get sucked into that crowd for the reason I mentioned. And then I think once you're in it, human behavior, I mean, humans are capable of just about anything in a crowd. Yeah. Thank you for the question, David, and thank you for the answer, Russell. Yes, I'm sure uh, we all behave differently in a crowd. Um, Michael has got the next question. He's got his hand up. So, Michael, thanks. please go ahead. Thanks, Martin, and thanks, Russell, for an absolutely amazing, fantastic talk. Uh, very thought-provoking indeed, and I am made a note of uh, the library of mistakes, which I will be visiting in the very near term. Um, I'm just reflecting and I suppose building a little bit on what David was asking. I mean, is there anything that regulators or governments can do to mitigate some of these risks? Because if you look back in history and the various sort of issues and events that happen, and then invariably there's a big review and a big hue and cry, and you know, governments and regulators try to introduce new laws or regulations to try and mitigate these risks but then the same things happen over and over again um i mean is that just again coming back to how we are designed as human beings or is there something more fundamental that um governments and regulators can do to try and mitigate some of these risks going forward yeah i think there is something we can do i should say that you'll never eradicate them it's just not going to happen that's the nature of, of human beings and uh, you know i personally just believe that we all have this kind of risk thermometer. If I clamp down on your risk taking activity in one place, it'll ramp up somewhere else. So I think driving is a pretty good example. The arrival of the seatbelt has you know, significantly reduced road deaths, but it may have significantly uh, increased the speed at which we all we all drive. So people will adjust, but maybe they would adjust in a different different area. So what I think we should be doing is not legislation, it's incentives. And when the incentives are wrong, everything is wrong. And I, I would have no hesitation in saying the incentives in finance are entirely wrong. Now, the incentive, you might say, well, what sort of incentives? Well, putting people in prison might be a good start. And uh, we need to put more people in jail who come up with these things. Uh, hardly anybody, certainly in this country, goes to jail. But even in America, they do plea bargains and don't go to jail. Uh, I've just reviewed a book by a friend called Jared Biebler, who put quite a lot of the Icelandic bankers in jail. Uh, they deserve to go to jail. So incentives are uh, carrots and sticks. And that's not a lot of legislation. You know, Iceland had a lot of legislation. We had a lot of legislation. Their bankers broke the legislation. Our bankers broke the legislation. Their bankers went to jail. Our bankers didn't. But I don't want to, I mean, I'm, I'm, I really don't want to focus it too much on bankers because this, where we are today, is spelled well, spelled well beyond that. But everybody who's running these schemes knows there is virtually no chance that they're ever going to go to prison for this. They may have to disgorge their profits. They may have to pay a fine. But ultimately, that sanction that you and I would face if we went down to Princess Street and robbed the uh, Royal Bank of Scotland absolutely doesn't apply to them. So it's uh, that sort of incentives. I'm not suggesting we abolish all the legislation. I'm just suggesting it really doesn't matter if you have the legislation, if people know they can get away with this. And let's face it, nearly everybody gets away with it. Thank you again for the question, Michael, and the answer there, Russell. Uh, Maggie wants to ask a question, and then it's Oscar, I think. Um, so Maggie first. Once you come off mute, Maggie. That's it. Thank you, Russell, for your um, amazing talk. Um, it was interesting. Um, I was reading at the weekend about um, John McFall, who is the leader of the House of Lords. And he, um, I discovered, was the... Um, person who chaired the Common Select Committee on Finance when they interrogated in 2008 um, Britain's top bankers and he managed to get an apology from them. But he, the, the main reason he managed to get this apology 
it's questionable whether anything else really came out of it, but was because he asked the tough questions. Now, surely when any of us make a, a, a mistake, we have to ask ourselves the tough and the right questions to, to hopefully get the right answers. Um, and it was interesting because a chap, Martin Gilbert, co-founder of Aberdeen Asset Management, described his day at the Treasury Committee as the worst day of his life, but it was the best thing that happened to him. So maybe that did actually appearing and having those tough questions, you know, did yeah. have some effect. But ultimately, all these years later, have things really changed that much? Yeah, so I, I mean, that might be a psychological compliment, a psychological incentive not to do bad things, but it's not much. <laughs> I mean, if that's no. all there is, it's not much. So I mean, I mean, so there's another way you could do this. So we, if we go back to the 19th century, for instance, and we talk about these banks, and uh, obviously RBS was around, Bank of Scotland was around, mm -hmm. uh, but not all of them, not the, but most of them actually had what we know as what we call today as unlimited liability. So if I was a banker and I, you know, made all these mistakes, it wasn't just so the Bank of Glasgow famously went bankrupt in the late 19th century. If you'd been an investor in the Bank of Glasgow, you didn't lose all your money. You lost all your money and then uh, all your personal net wealth as well. You had to keep chipping in and chipping in to make sure that everybody mm -hmm. was satisfied. Now, that's an incredible incentive for you to run a good bank. Didn't that actually happen to work in the course of cases of the city of Glasgow Bank? Uh, but the people who testified in that particular thing, every Christmas, had they made a certain amount of money, they got a certain size of bonus and they never had to pay it back. So, every, so all you had to do was run the institution with the basis that whatever went wrong on the downside, you could never be financially held accountable to it. Now, you could be dragged in front of the House of Commons and you could be interrogated or tortured, but ultimately the incentive was entirely for you. Now, the 19th century had its problems in finance, but we actually didn't have a lot of banks going bankrupt because the people who ran the banks knew not only would they be kind of ruined and being pariahs in society, but they'd lose their house. Now, can we go back to that scenario, which is kind of like a partnership scenario? Probably not. But we can begin to make some changes in the incentive structure so that people pay higher penalties than just being embarrassed in front of the House of, House of Commons. It's actually not difficult. It's extremely easy to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are some countries that do it better than others. So th and that's what I, you know, answering the last question. It's got to be about incentives. Uh, and, you know, we, we know how to do this. The question is, can we actually get the political clout to go ahead, go ahead and do it? And it has to be more than embarrassing people in public, I'm afraid. We've got a bit of that going on in the House of Commons at the minute. I don't know, <laughs> if, it, I don't know if it's really going to change any behaviour at all. Yeah. I, I, the, one of the reasons I asked this, Russell, is because you've probably gathered my background is not in finance at all. I was, believe it or not, a nurse. But for... We, we used to have things called significant event analysis. When if something went wrong at work, we had to investigate it and we would all discuss the whys and wherefores of how this thing went wrong. Now, at its most serious level, if I did something really bad, I would be struck off the register. I could be criminally prosecuted and I could be put in jail. Um, and I sometimes feel if, 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 you know, we have these sort of punishments, if you like, how come that financial and bankers not seem to always get away with it? Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a brilliant point because there's one profession that learns from every mistake. In fact, I don't really think there's ever been a mistake that they didn't learn from. Uh, and those mistakes, are, that profession, are called pilots. And the reason that they learn is they have something called the black box. Mm -hmm. And when things go wrong, we know who did it. You, there's no sitting around in a committee room pointing at him and pointing at him and pointing at him. There is a, there is a black box. No, I don't know. It sounds like as a, as a nurse, that's kind of what they tried to create. They tried to create that record that, you know, when the time came, you couldn't point to somebody else or somebody else. That's what we need in finance, well, not just in finance, we need it more generally so that there is you know, very clear lines of responsibility where you can, and a black box to record it, where you can say this person is the person who made the mistake. Because what happened in those committee rooms is they all pointed to each other. 
-hmm. and ultimately none of them could be found. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, did they commit criminal offences? I don't know, but they certainly took huge amounts of risk, excessive amounts of risk for their own personal gain. And we could have easily designed the system where they weren't rewarded for taking huge risks with our money as shareholders, but also as taxpayers for their own personal gain. And if there'd been a proper record kept, then it would be much easier uh, to hold people account. So I think maybe we should learn from pilots. I think maybe in the boardroom, we need a black box. Uh, uh, Richard Nixon had one, and when he finally divulged his black box, it did help significantly working out who did what in the White House during uh, in, the, in the early 1970s. Yes, the Watergate situation. Mm -hmm and it cost him his presidency. Yeah. Um, again, great question, Maggie and Russell. Thank you for that. Um, time for one more question. We, we, two of our particular guests, I wonder whether Alan McCulloch or Sandy wish to ask questions. You don't have to, but if you do, this would be a great opportunity. Um, Alan, anything from you with your Diageo background, the world's biggest drinks manufacturer? Well, 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 well not, not, not. Well, not particularly, but I, I was interested uh, uh, in the reference to novels. And of course, one of the greatest, I think, was Charles Dickens, Mr. Micawber, who gave pretty sound advice on a personal level. Would Would you agree? Yes, I've often you thought that advice was, Alan. Yeah, right. You might know it word for word, Alan. What do you give us it? Well, I think it's uh, uh, annual income... Uh, twenty pound annual annual expenditure, twenty pound and sixpence result happiness. Annual income, twenty pound annual expenditure, uh, uh, twenty one pound, uh, twenty pound and six misery. In other words, if you spend more, you're going to have misery. If you spend less, you're going to be uh, content. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I find that interesting because what so many of the books in this library are about the birth creation of a thing called personal credit, which didn't exist in the age of Mr. McCorber. Now, it kind of slightly existed because if he had a watch, he could probably hawk the watch in the pawn shop. But on the whole, as a consumer, you couldn't, buy, you couldn't borrow for consumption. It was actually impossible. You could probably just about borrow some money to maybe invest in something as a small businessman, buy a cart, buy a barrow start selling stuff. But you certainly couldn't find anybody who would lend you money to consume. This was considered, and a lot of it actually comes from religion, or comes from a certain uh, brand of religion, uh, basically a, a sin to, to borrow money for consumption. Now, we, we, uh, we shed those shackles a very long time ago, actually really in the 1920s. And consumer credit is available for consumption, not just for uh, investment, uh, not just for buying a home, not just for buying a, a big ticket item like a car, but for buying buying clothing. So we facilitated that. I guess there are two ways you can look at it. We facilitated more choice so that a 16 year old can literally borrow money to go and buy clothes. Uh, is it good that they have more choice or is there some way we should be educating people that borrowing money for consumption is not a good thing? So I'm, I'm involved in that as well through a, through a charity called the Stuart Ivory Foundation Education Trust. Uh, but I think it's more about educating people that you know, some forms of borrowing are perfectly legitimate, particularly to buy a home, I think, to finance your education, of course. Uh, but what Macawber didn't have access to, because it would be considered outlandish at the time, was borrowing money simply to spend it. So people were kept, if you like, the system kept people within the, the Macawber bounds, because actually nobody would lend you money to go, nobody would lend you money to consume. Uh, but uh, we, have <laughs> slipped, we have slipped the Macawber bounds. I don't think we can go back, but I think education is a, is a key way to convince people that borrowing, borrowing for consumption is a dangerous place to be. Very tempting, of course it's very tempting, but it doesn't get you to a good place, particularly given mm -hmm. the interest rates we're currently charging people on credit cards, regardless of where uh, interest rates are. So yeah, I mean, and there's lots more. I mean, I, I've written a, 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 this book called Anatomy of the Bear, and it, it looks at four uh, periods, and it quotes extensively from four novels written in the periods. And I think those novels are crammed with very good financial advice, explaining the zeitgeist of the time and why mistakes were made. And uh, yeah, it's a very important point. This is about the mistakes are made because there's a mass psychology and you can find that as easily in literature as you can find it in finance. Again, thank you for your question there, okay. Alan, and your comments, Russell. Um, Oscar was pointing out that Sandy, did you want to make a question yes you did you need to come off mute if you would Sandy. Yeah. Well, okay. and we'll make this the last question because i promised russell it would only be 40 minutes and because okay. of the fascination we're running over but go ahead sandy 
Thank you very much, Russell, for that very interesting uh, lecture. Um, I just have one quick question. Is Scotland being led down a financially disastrous road currently? <laughs> nice, easy question, Russell. Yeah, nice. I mean, I mean, where do I start on that? I mean, I, I mean, the answer is yes. But then, am I saying that it's unique to Scotland? I don't think it is unique to Scotland. So I think the whole of the developed world. Let's start with the whole of the developed world. There is far, far too much debt relative to the size of the economy, not just at the government, but at the household level and the corporate level. So as they say in Ireland, when you ask directions, well, it depends where you start. Well, we're starting in a position that I think we're all being led down that route, regardless whether it's Scotland, England, Wales, Northern Ireland, America, France, or Germany. These debts have to be inflated away, full stop. They have to be inflated away. So we will move into an era of much higher inflation I, Sandy, maybe I can give you my opinions on Scotland separately, uh, but let's just say that, that, that things would not be better if that particular thing happened. That would make it worse rather than better. Uh, but we all have to prepare now for this thing. And this, you know, so we look at it badly, inflating away debts. It is very bad for savers and pensioners. But the idea is to engineer a huge transfer of wealth from savers and pensioners to debtors. And that if, if we can get wages growing at say five or 6% and interest rates at two, 3%, then that's incredibly good for people who borrow money and incredibly bad for people who lend money and which is what pensioners do through their various, uh, various investments. So disastrous, absolutely, if you're a saver, I think we're heading down a disastrous route, but remember for lots of these periods, they can be very beneficial for other members of society. So if I look at the post-World War II period, for instance, had you been a saver in 1945 owning government bonds, you'd have lost, in terms of the purchasing power, you'd have lost 90% of your money between 1945 and 1980. So as a saver, that was disastrous. Mm -hmm. but, in, but in 1957, the prime minister of this country said we'd never had it so good. Uh, and he was probably right. If you were just the average guy in the street with no savings and a bit of debt, you probably never had it so good. So I see it kind of disastrous because I tend to look at it from the perspective of somebody who saves and I advise savers. Uh, but for younger people, I'm, I think it, for at least five, 10 years, it could feel really quite pleasant. And uh, the, the negative implications of all that inflation tend to take a while to come through. So uh, it depends where you see it from. But uh, Scottish, uh, the, the, the issues unique to Scotland, we'll, we'll discuss over a pint sometime, maybe. <laughs> okay. well, Thank you very much. Good question. Great question. And, and Russell, uh, for the clarity of your answers, as well as your excellent presentation, Peter Sutton is just going to uh, close our meeting. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Peter was just going to do a, a short thank you. So over to you, Peter. Um, well, thank you to Martin for gathering us all, and particularly thank you to Russell, so, sorry, I missed most of it. I enjoyed the answers to the questions. And my, my one thought as well is within all this easy access to money and uh, borrowing just to consume, there's also that sense, and I hear Russell, you're writing about education. I mean, it's that sense, particularly for younger people, that there's no, you don't involve waiting anymore or saving. It's immediate gratification because you can just go out and get what you want whatever the consequences. And the flip side of that is that might seem great. You can go and get those new trainers or whatever, but it's, it doesn't prepare you for life in itself, and namely the knocks, the failures, the mm. inabilities to, to get to where you want to. Your goals aren't as easy to achieve as it is to buy your phone or your trainers. And I think there's a great sort of link, moral link between the two there, the borrowing, but at the same time, the immediate gratification. I think in the church um, where we, we're coming from, you try to be patient, but we too are more and more being caught up in a world which demands immediate answers and solutions uh, to things which sometimes have a more ethereal or eternal dimension to them. But great questions. And um, I really uh, do appreciate you giving up your time on behalf of us. Thanks to the Oasis uh, team and uh, thanks, Russell, for giving us uh, the good talk that I believe you did from what everyone's saying, but particularly the excellent answers to the, the questions. And um, 
I don't know, Martin, if you want to say something about the next meeting. Yes, thank you. Uh, the next one's on Thursday, the 24th of June at 12.30. Our guest is Anne Budge, which again will be a financial side. It's how she got started with money. Most people know Anne Budge today as the chairperson or the chair CEO of Hearts Football Club. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lady who managed to make some money um, and uh, is still very much a key personality within Edinburgh. But Russell, thank you very much. Thank you also for the kind invitation to actually go to the Library of Mistakes, which I certainly will make a point of doing and picking up one of your throwaway lines. I know you give seminars to people and you said you had to find bigger rooms. You are very welcome to use St. Cuthbert's. Uh, we've just removed most of the pews of St. Cuthbert's so we could easily accommodate a seminar of 200 people if you want to bring them along and it would be our way of is, helping you as a thank you today so is mammon is mammon is mammon really welcome back into the temple oh very much so yes we, we, we it's only open for sinners it's only open for sinners so <laughs> we would we would love love to have you talking and of course the whole purpose of oasis is to bring people together from all walks of life so the great thing is god never asked us to make judgments we just welcome people so uh, russell thank you very much indeed and thank you everybody else for joining us uh, take care and I hope to see you at the end of June, if not before. Thank you.